Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. And this is the last in a series of four programs honoring my mother's 70th birthday with four programs that aired on the day of her birth. Next up is an episode of Mr. President. Mr. President was a series that aired over the radio from 1946 to 1953 and starred Edward Arnold as Mr. President. Now you might wonder, is this a generic Mr. President or is this a very specific Mr. President? Well, it's actually all the presidents. The idea of the series was that they would take an incident from the life of one of the presidents each week, and the play would be about that, with Mr. Arnold playing whoever the president was. And you would guess at the end of the program as to which president that it was. With that said, let's go ahead and have a listen to Mr. President from August the 15th of 1948. The President, starring Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Edward Arnold. (laughs) Mr. President, at home in the White House, the elected leader of our people, our fellow citizen and neighbor. These are little-known stories of the men who've lived in the White House. Dramatic, exciting events in their lives that you and I so rarely hear. True human stories of Mr. President. Our Mr. President story will begin in just a moment. But meantime, how extensive is your knowledge of our country's past presidents? For example, can you name the president who once sold all the White House furniture? Or the president who had a habit of bathing in the canal back of the White House? Now, there are so many colorful anecdotes about our former chief executives that it's not surprising we find the lives of American presidents so fascinating. Perhaps it's because most of us can identify ourselves with their way of life. Their private ambitions, their wives, children, and friends are so much like our own that we often feel their stories are our stories, too. Each Sunday afternoon, Mr. President removes the pedestal from under our famous leaders to reveal them as they were. Human beings whose desires and ambitions were much the same as yours and mine. Now, listen to this absorbing drama and see if you can name the president upon whom this episode is built. And now, in just a moment, Edward Arnold. Edward Arnold as Mr. President. Let's visit him in the White House. It is Sunday, and the old mansion is resting quietly after a busy week. We walk through the great doors under the presidential seal, across the foyer and down the long hall to the president's study. Oh, hello. Come in, won't you? Sit down. You know, there are times when a president wonders why anybody, including himself, ever wants to be president. It is really the hardest job in the world, and it would be so much easier, well, if men used their good sense more often and their tempers less often. Government and just plain living would be a lot easier and much happier. And that's the idea back of this story. Later on, of course, I'll tell you which president this really happened to. But meanwhile, you may be able to guess. I had trouble on my hands... And there was trouble going on in Congress as usual, and the center of the trouble in the Senate lay with a group of hot-headed young Southerners led by Tom Lee, my own son-in-law. So I sent for Tom and one of the leaders in the House of Representatives, Joe Stevens. I was all set for them by the time they came into my office. Good day, gentlemen. How are you, Tom? 
Very well, sir. And you? Oh, fine. Just fine. I'm glad to see you, Joe. Thank you, Mr. President. Sit down, gentlemen. Would you sit down? Frankly, sir, I'm not sure we'll be here long enough to make sitting down necessary. Joe's pretty sure what you want us for, sir. And if it's anything to do with a territorial problem before Congress at the moment, Mr. President, you know exactly where we stand. The South insists on its rights, sir. We intend to have them one way or another. I had hoped, Joe, that a quiet discussion here among ourselves, you as a leader in the House and Tom, a leader in the Senate, that we might arrive at some compromise. There is no compromise, Mr. There is always a compromise somewhere, Not this time. Any compromise on the part of the South means a loss to the South. And a correspondent victory for the North. Certainly you see that, sir. We mean to maintain our rights, Mr. President. Equal rights with anyone in any territory of the United States. In fact, sir, we maintain that whoever gets there first, North or South, is the determinant party. Tom, Joe, you said all this before. Apparently you failed to understand it, sir. When it was said formally in both houses of Congress. I failed to understand nothing. A child could see that the South is bent on having its own way and will brook no interference regardless of the will of the people. When the North discusses this subject, sir, it speaks of theories. Yes, Tom, theories of liberty and freedom of upholding the Constitution. When we discuss this matter, we speak of rights of property. Rights thoroughly protected by the Constitution. No man shall be deprived of property without... I have read the document, gentlemen. Very well, Mr. President. You know where we stand. And you know where I stand. But how can you, sir? You're a southerner yourself. Yet in this, you're siding with the North. I'm siding with the North, Tom, because I intend to fulfill my oath to preserve and defend the Union. That may be harder to do than you expect, sir. I, for one, I'm sick of this kind of talk. I understand this, Mr. President. In your presence in the South, the South will take a walk, sir. Out of Congress, out of the party, and out of the Union. And in such a case, Stevens, I will take personal command of the United States Army and hang every ringleader I can catch. Good day, Mr. President. Good day, sir. Tom, one moment. I thought through you... Come and leave. You thought, sir, that because we once went through the same sorrow, you could effect a compromise through me, is that right? Yes, exactly right. I'm offering you my hand in friendship. You know me better than that, sir. I am the president's son-in-law second, and a southerner first. You haven't changed, have you? I shall never change, sir. Make up your mind to that. All right, Stevens, let's go. Miss Sarah? Miss Sarah, come in here. Yes, sir. What can I do for you, Mr. Did you hear what went on in this room? Did you hear it? The door was shut, sir, but toward the close of the interview, what with raised voices... I can't understand it, the young whippersnapper. Not that it hasn't happened before. Congressman Stevens is known for his temper, sir, but... Well, your son-in-law, it is a little hard to understand. I... I think, Miss Sarah, I may be a little more disappointed and hurt than angry with him. I had thought that the years and sorrow might have changed him. Senator Lee is a proud man, Mr. President. He always has been. Do you know, Miss Sarah, that years ago when I was a colonel and he was a lieutenant, he wanted to fight me? I didn't know that, Mr. President. A lieutenant and a colonel? Mm, The small matter of rank never bothered Tom Lee. Well, I remember once I ordered him to report to me on an entirely different matter. He was as defiant then as he was a man. Lieutenant Lee, this is a difficult matter for me. Difficult for any commanding officer because it is a personal matter. Yes, sir. I order you to stay away from my daughter, sir. Sir, with all respect to your rank, that is one order you cannot give me and expect to have it obeyed. Would you care to face a court martial, Lieutenant? No, sir. Nor would you care to bring such a charge. Loving your daughter, sir, is not prohibited under the Articles of War. I prohibit it. I'll not have my daughter married into the Army. I know too much of Army life. I hardly know my own children, or they me. And I do know what, Colonel... That you, sir, for what reason, I don't know. Certain reports reached me concerning motives imputed to me by you that are entirely outside the realm of possibility for a gentleman. Where there's smoke, there's fire, young man. And the fact remains that your attentions to my daughter will cease as of now. That's an order, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. I expect that order will be countermanded by your daughter, sir. Dismiss! Yes, sir. Now for all the colossal impudence, orders countermanded, no right to. Well, we'll I see. heard it, Dad, every last word of it. And... Tom's right, I will countermand your order. And listen to me, I'll not have you married to that Mississippi firebrand. I won't have it. You can't stop me, Dad. You can't. It's for your own good, my dear. I'll do everything in my power. And so will I. I don't have much power, but somehow, some way, Dad, I love Tom and he loves me, and 
And we won't stop, not ever. Did this to us? I'll never... I don't think he did, darling. I, as a matter of fact, I'm sure he didn't. In the course of army events, a lieutenant finishes his tour of duty on the frontier and is transferred automatically to another post. Are you really sure, Tom? Yes. <laughs> of course, your father may have helped matters along a little. Oh, no, he has to sign papers and all that. And will it be out of sight, out of mind? Not ever, darling. Because for me, it won't. Remember that, please. Of course, I will. Come here once in a while and think of us in this room. Dad knew what he'd say to Mary for letting us meet here. <laughs> I'd like to see his face if he ever finds out. Oh, well, I wouldn't. Dad's a good man. Tom, he has ideas and prejudices. Sometimes they blind him a little. Well, sometimes they blind him a lot. I wish there was some way I could bring you two together. Well, maybe someday. But with you so far away, Tom, how are we right? Oh, I'll send my letters here in care of Mary. I miss you so. We're strong enough to wait, my darling. And when I get my captaincy, we... We can dream, can't we? And we can fight, too. We'll get there. You'll see. You'll get there. You'll see. Yes, Anne. I I've talked with Mother. Is there anything remarkable about that? Uh, about Tom. Oh, Anne, um, it's two years now. Are you still... Uh, do you still think you're in love with that... that Mississippi uh, Fire? Yes. Yes, Dad. And Mother says if you'll approve, she will. I'll see here, Anne. I uh, won't see Dad, and you know it. You ought to by now. One way or another, I'm going to Kentucky and marry Tom. I forbid I it. I won't listen. I've been miserable for two years, waiting, wait hoping you'd be reasonable. Reason? That was different. It wasn't different. He won't be just a lieutenant forever. He'll be important someday, and I'll be right up there with him. What you see in him, don't I... Don't let yourself, Dad. You'd see it, too. Please, Dad. Please don't make me run away. Let me go with your consent. Dad, you want me to be happy, don't you? I don't have much choice, do I, Anne? You say you'll go whether I agree or not. And Mother's on my side now. You may as well surrender graceful, Colonel, and retire from the field with honor. Well, all right. And I hope and pray, young lady, that the man of your choice is everything you say he is. Although, you won't mind if I entertain a few reservations of my own on that subject now, will you? I'm grateful you're here, David. Times like this, that's what friends are for, Tom. Huh? Oh, David, she's so young. Malaria is a nasty business, Tom. Oh, to wait all these years for it, married three months, and then this. Why, David? Can you tell me why? Oh, Tom, uh, there's no sense to it. No. I'm here, darling. Don't go, David, please. I'll be right here. I'm here, darling, right here. I'm cold. Tom, so cold. Another chill? No, it's a different kind of cold. Uh, Tom, Doctor. Yes, dear. Promise me something, please. Of course. When if anything happens to me, you'll be kind today. Oh, he doesn't need my kindness. You don't know. He you try to get along with it. Promise me. Promise. I'll try, darling. That's a promise. Afterwards, he told me what she'd made him promise. All through the war and until now, I thought he would keep that promise. But no. You'd think a man would grow up with the years. Ordinary rules don't seem to hold for men born and raised in Mississippi, Miss Arm. They are prideful lot, aren't they? They're independent and haughty. And born with iron rods in place of normal spines. Senator Lee seems to have bent a little. And I'm afraid it'll have to bend a little bit more. What can you do, Mr. President? I don't know as yet, but I do know two things. Congress will have to work out some sort of compromise, and Tom Lee, Joe Stevens, and company will have to accept it. Can you make them accept it? I'm the president, Miss Allen. 
I swore to preserve and protect the Union, and I intend to do so. There'll be no compromise on that score. You can count on it. I may lose my last link with poor little Anne in the process, but I'll keep the Union intact even if I have to break my stubborn son-in-law to do it. In just a moment, we'll come back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. More and more, people are realizing that accidents can happen to them and not always to someone else. But too many people are still not fully conscious of this fact. For proof, consider these figures. In 1947, 1,100,000 Americans were injured and 32,000 killed on our highways. Furthermore, the cost to our nation amounted to $2,200,000, and that's no laughing matter. Perhaps the most distressing thought on the subject is that most of these accidents can be avoided. For safety's sake, be careful. The life you save may be your own. And for the pedestrian, the most dangerous act is crossing between intersections. For the motorist, speeding is the factor most commonly reported as contributing to traffic accidents. You can't afford to be careless, so use common sense, obey all traffic regulations, and remember that an accident can happen to you. And now, back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. Now, you may have guessed which president the story is about. Later on, of course, I'll tell you which one it was. I meant every word I said to Miss Sarah the day I told her the story of Tom Lee and my daughter Anne. I intended to do anything in my power as president to preserve the Union. And I used all my influence to bring about some kind of compromise in Congress. But it's hard to satisfy all parties, and my southern friends were adamant in their determination to have their way. Over on Capitol Hill, especially in the Senate, the battle was furious. Tom Lee rose in the Senate chamber one morning and entered the debate. The question before the Senate is simply this. Shall the South have equal rights with the North and the territories of the United States? It is suggested that this right be denied us. We stand now upon the Constitution. We have lived and we will die by the Constitution. If the majority of this Congress ignores the Constitution... Then this union is at an end. Will the gentleman from Mississippi yield? Will the gentleman from Mississippi yield for a suggestion? I yield to the gentleman from South Carolina. Uh, Thank you, sir. The federal government, through a northern majority, is encroaching upon the rights of the states. The tariff of abominations was enacted by a northern majority. I've seen that same majority take away the rights of states one by one. And now this matter of limiting Southern participation in the exploitation of American territory. Exploitation. The time has come, gentlemen, for a constitutional amendment. An amendment providing for two presidents. One for the North and one for the South. Each with veto power over congressional legislation. No. No. The gentleman from Mississippi still holds the floor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Senator Carter's suggestion of two presidents under the one flag seems to me to be the suggestion of a man who wishes to preserve the Union in a situation where the word Union would become fiction in a world of fact. The recent, recent war with its glorious victory showed us what we could do as one nation. There was no division on the battlefield. When the 2nd Indiana Infantry broke under enemy attack, It was the Mississippi Rifles who moved forward through their broken ranks and saved the day. I yield for a question to the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you. I would ask, what was the recent war fought for? For special interests in the South? Was it fought to perpetuate inequities? And I asked my colleague from Mississippi where he was on the day the Indiana Infantry broke. I was there, and believe me, the Mississippi Rifles not only did not save the day... They were not within one mile and a half of the scene of action. That is a lie, sir. An outrageous untruth. I was there. It was the truth. Second Kentucky and the first and second Illinois met and repulsed the enemy. Oh, now, Tom, don't 
be a fool. When the honor of a Mississippi regiment is challenged and I am shouted down on the floor of the Senate, I cannot take it lying down. But you call him a liar. Well, he did lie. David, I want you to take his letter to Senator Nielsen. Well, what's in it? It's a demand for a retraction. Well, I don't believe Bill Nielsen will retract one word. Well, here's the letter. Please deliver it in person, David, and wait for a reply. And if he doesn't retract, if the reply is not satisfactory? My regiment was charged with cowardice. It's all a part of the same thing. Anything to vilify us. David, if you are my friend and I have every reason to believe that you are, you will tell Senator Nielsen that unless I receive a complete retraction, I demand satisfaction on the field of honor. And he should have a friend arrange the necessary preliminaries with you. Well, Senator Stevens, what's on your mind? I've come to warn you, sir. Your threat of force against us, should we take appropriate action in view of the situation over the territories, has reached many years. You come to warn me? Yes, sir. The South will not tolerate the use of force, not Stevens, without countermeasures. Stevens, do you realize you're speaking to the President of the United States? And to the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces? I'm fully aware of that, Mr. President. Then beware of this, too. I will not use force except all else has failed. There are other means of keeping you in the Union. Such as? Thomas Jefferson had an idea, and a good one. He said that in the event of such a threat uh, that you are making, he would send a fleet to blockade your harbors. He would levy duties on all goods going into your states and prevent anything from coming out. Hmm. And that is exactly what I will do, sir. I won't need the army. I'll starve you into staying into the Union. Futile, sir. As futile as trying to stop your son-in-law from fighting William Nielsen. What did you say? Your son-in-law is going to fight Senator Nielsen over a charge against the Mississippi Regiment. It's an open secret at the Capitol. Everyone thinks you know, sir. I know now. That's beside the point, Mr. President. You can't stop us and you can't stop them. I'll stop all of you by Harry. I'll have Tom Nielsen in this office in one hour. And if necessary, I'll send the Capitol Provost Marshal and the Rifle of Marines to bring them in. <laughs> Gentlemen, the president is waiting for you. Senators Lee and Nielsen, if you two were both 20 years younger, I should take you over my knee and administer the back of a hairbrush. When a man, a senator, and an officer in the army, Mr. President, is challenged, he cannot refuse. You had the choice of weapons, I believe. Yes, sir. And you chose? Guns, loaded with buckshot. Not much chance of missing, is there? Hardly, Mr. President. Senator Lee, what have you to say for yourself? I am here under compulsion, sir. I have nothing to say. You started this. Now speak up. That's an order. I have said my say, sir. Very well. Then I'll have mine. I'm not amused by the spectacle of two United States senators engaged in the pastime of murdering each other. I won't have it. If you were private persons, you could do as you please and be dead. Well, there's not much use in losing our tempers, is there? We're past that, Mr. President. You ought to be. The positions you hold would indicate that you are. But your behavior... Tom, Bill, isn't there some way this matter can be settled without gunfire? I see no other way, sir. I tried to reassure the senator through David Randolph that I intended no insult to his regiment. Ah. My reply stated that I made no charge against the Mississippi rifles. My statement was meant only to do justice to those living or dead whose conduct fell under my observation on that occasion. The senator's statement in the chamber left no doubt that he implied that the Mississippi rifles were far from the scene of action by choice. Is that what you intended, Bill? Absolutely not. If by some means we had Senator Nielsen's statement amended in the record, that would be... Would you be satisfied, Tom? I see no possible amendments. Sir. We'll make one. Bill, what was your statement, the last one? I said the truth. Namely, that the Mississippi Regiment was not within one mile and a half of the scene of action. An insult if there ever was one. Just a moment, Tom. Just a moment, Bill. Suppose we added something like this. But I am willing to award them the credit due to their gallant and distinguished services in that battle. Would that be acceptable to you, Bill? Well, I see nothing in that statement beyond the truth, sir. Very good. And Tom? If the senator is honest in his acceptance of your phrase... Do you doubt my honesty as well as... Oh, I'd... stop it! Grow up, you two, will you? No one is questioning anyone's honesty. Tom, do you accept the amendment, yes or no? I do, sir. And the fight is off. A challenge? Yes, sir. There seems to be no reason any longer for... For two senators to kill each other? There never was any reason. Now, let me see you two shake hands. Come on. Come on. Come on. Senator Nielsen, 
Ah, excellent, gentlemen, excellent. You see, compromise can be found on most anything. I'm happy to hear you say that, sir. There's a caucus at the Capitol now on the territorial question. And you two northern, you northerners think you can find a way out, eh? I'm most anxious to take a part in it, sir. Very well, go along then. Thank you for coming to the White House. <laughs> Thank you for sending for us. I should hate to have had to kill so fine a young man. Sir, had we met on the field of honor, I think it is I. Oh, for <laughs> heaven's sake, stop it, will you? Let's not start the fight all over again as to who might have won. This way you both win. <laughs> oh, that's a little better. That's a little better. Well, good day, sir. <laughs> Goodbye, Bill. Senator Lee. Your servant, sir. Oh, Tom. A week ago, I offered you my hand in friendship. Here it is again. This time, sir, I shall take it. I... I think Anne would have liked to see that, sir. Yes, I think she would have. Tom, uh, do you think uh, you've learned anything this time? Meaning, sir? You've just seen a compromise save a man's life. Maybe yours. Don't you think it's worth a try to save this union? Well, I... This country is headed for troubled times, Tom. I'd hate to think that hot-headedness was a cause for wrecking the nation. You two came in here convinced that a compromise was impossible. You found out that it wasn't. Now, will you give the nation the same consideration you gave your own life? <laughs> well, when you put it that way, sir... Go back up there, determined to compromise, and you will compromise. The whole nation will then be the victor, and history will applaud your actions. But go back determined. Determined to fight. You don't need to go into that, sir. I've learned my lesson. And I've learned to be proud of you as a son. You know, Tom, if I've learned anything in all these years, it's this. If men used their good sense more often and lost their tempers less, government would be a lot easier and just plain living would be a lot more fun. <laughs> Well, you've probably figured out by now who I was when all that happened. It really did happen, you know, and I'll tell you the answer in just a moment. When a radio program combines vital issues of the day along with absorbing drama, it makes for entertaining listening. Such a program is ABC's David Harding Counterspy. Although Counterspy is primarily a mystery drama, it recently has presented a series of hard-hitting dramas pointing to the problems of the nation today. In fact, so great has been Counterspy's effect in presenting these timely issues that educators throughout the country have praised the program for its educational value. Counterspy has also been cited by the United States Treasury Department for its contribution of radio time in promoting the War Trophies campaign. David Harding Counterspy brings you a complete fast-moving drama every Sunday afternoon over most of these ABC stations. Now, here again is Edward Arnold. Well, you probably have guessed by now that today's story took place in 1850, at the time the battle was being fought in Congress between the North and the South over the admission of California as a state of the Union. The president was old, rough and ready Zachary Taylor, who was such a great general in the war with Mexico in 1846. His firebrand son-in-law from Mississippi was Senator Jefferson Davis, the same Jeff Davis who, 11 years later, became the president of the Confederate States of America. And I'm sure there isn't one of you who hasn't some memory of the struggle, of the struggle they had to work out a compromise, the famous compromise of 1850. Come and see me again next week, won't you? I'll have another story for you about Mr. President that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Goodbye.
Edward Arnold appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Julia Misbehaves, starring Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon. <laughs> Mr. President was created by Robert G. Jennings. It is produced and directed by Dwight Hauser. Miss Sarah was played by Betty Lou Gerson. This story by Ira Marion was suggested by incidents in the administration of President Zachary Taylor. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be sure to listen again next week when the American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations bring you Edward Arnold with another interesting and factual story of Mr. President. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. An interesting episode, uh, I guess, as knowing a bit of the history, I, I find the message that's being given about the importance of compromise. I'm not disagreeing with it, but I'm not certain this is the best example for it. Because the compromise they're referring to is the Compromise of 1850. And, of course, this grand compromise actually only lasted 11 years. And in fact, Congress undermined the compromise, so you had people killing each other in what was known as Bleeding Kansas out in the Kansas Territory. And from the perspective of the Southerners who Zachary Taylor persuades to compromise, I've heard some historians actually say that they think the South would have won if the Civil War had happened in the 1850s. So, from the perspective of Taylor's son-in-law, his learning to compromise didn't actually solve anything in the long term, led to his direct defeat in war, having to flee for his life, and eventually be caught in women's clothing trying to escape from capture. Um, what was the moral you were trying to teach with this story again? All kidding, and historical nitpicks aside, this was a good production, and, and I think it had an interesting concept. I will comment that some old-time radio, or I should say most old-time radio dealers, have ruined a key aspect of the series. Because one of the big challenges of Mr. President is as you are listening to the program, you're supposed to be able to guess who the president is. However, most old-time radio vendors, uh, when they go ahead and they uh, sell this series or they make it available online, for the title of the episode, they put the name of the president. So as you're listening to it, all the suspense has been taken away because the dealer decided to put the name on there. And I didn't put it on the title, and I'm hoping that it doesn't go into the meta tags so that you can enjoy the series as it was originally intended to be enjoyed. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode of Mr. President. I particularly hope my mom uh, has enjoyed this whole series of programs. Uh, I won't go too much into it. She really uh, means a lot to me, and I'm so grateful for her. I wish her the best of birthdays, and uh, we will be back on the amazing world of radio sometime around Thanksgiving. Uh, so be sure and listen to us then. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.